Hi everyone. My name is Riddhi. Welcome. Uh, Two Sigma is excited to be hosting the New York Open Statistical Programming Meetup. Founded by Josh Reif and Drew Conway, this meetup started in 2009 with just a handful of people. Since then, it has grown to over 14,000 members from around the world. The mission is to spread knowledge of statistical programming techniques in open source languages like R, Python, Julia, and Go, and data science in general. I'll now hand it over to Jared Lander, the organizer of the meetup, chief data scientist of Lander Analytics, and the author of R for Everyone. So welcome, everybody. It's great to be back in person again. It's been a long time, been a long time coming. I'm glad everyone who's here virtually, thank you for attending. People in person, we had a few last year and one in January. It's really exciting to have all these people in the room again, so I'm very, very excited about that. So uh, thank you all for being here. It's a great, great to see everybody. So first up, longtime members know that the first question I always ask is who is hiring? So is anyone here hiring? All right, uh, let's do a, can we have a second microphone we can pass back? And I'll repeat it for the camera in case the people can't hear. Yeah, right, right there. And can we confirm that the live stream has audio? Yeah. Yes, guys. Uh, my name is Ben Carlson. I work for a company called uh, DB01. We report uh, low level information about bonds. We're hiring for an integrations uh, analyst. This is an entry level position for someone with our experience. Um, You'll be involved in uh, helping to onboard new securitization start platform. Um, this is a role that will give you a lot of opportunity to learn how to use R as well as other languages like Python and potentially Scala. And um, you'll get a lot of ex uh, exposure to the fixed income uh, markets. And have you posted it at the NY Hackr Slack? I sure will. There you go. So if you coming in virtual land or even in person, NY Hackr Slack, you can find the jobs in there in the job posting channel. Right, so, and if you're virtually and you want to hire someone but you're not here, go to the NY Hackr Slack. You can find the link at nyhackr.org. In the top right, there's a little Slack icon. Click that, you can post a job, all right? Cool, all right, so last chance for jobs. All right, cool, so, as our regulars remember, when we were doing this every single month for like over 10 years, we didn't start this thing ever at the beginning, but it's been over 10 years, we always pick a different pizza place. This month's pizza is from Harry's Italian. I'll put it over here so people at home can see it. They specialize in their square slices. Though they're really rectangular, everyone calls them squares, right? But they specialize in square slices. Now this has great cheese locks, it's been sitting around a while. So everyone who's in here in person tasting this pizza, go to bit.ly slash pizza poll. Bitly slash pizza poll and go on there and rate the pizza on a scale of never again, poor, average, good, excellent. Yeah, you're, yeah, go take out your smartphones. I know you all have them. And check it out and rate the pizza. I see Paul's already doing it. Thank you, Paul. Paul's always on top of that. And let us know how the pizza is. Those of you coming to us virtually, let us know in Slack or in the YouTube chat anywhere, what are you eating right now? Are you eating pizza, are you eating pierogies, eating pasta, are you eating anything? So let us know. And I'm very proud to say that we're serving pizza here in the only city where you don't need to qualify what type of pizza it is. So, let us, know where, let us know what you're getting. I mentioned it briefly, but there's a wealth of information at nyhackr.org. You want to see 14 years of previous talks? We have slideshows, we have videos. You want to see job postings? There's so much great information at nyhackr.org. Check it out. I do want to say thank you to Two Sigma for hosting us. Uh, it's always great to have a space like this, so thank you very much. Uh, if we have an internal round of applause for all the Two Sigma people. And thank you to everyone involved with all the tech and everything. It's been a really great experience being here. Uh, we're getting used to being back in person, all the technology that goes with it. We have a few other things coming up soon. We have the New York R Conference coming up July 11th through 14th. There's an event we've been doing, I think, for the ninth year now. It grew organically out of this meetup into like a two-day party. Now it's like a four-day R party. We have two days of workshops and two days of talks. It's gonna be a really great time. We have speakers like Max Kuhn and Rob Hyman, Molly Hui and Asma Tumi. It's gonna be a really great time. Go to rstats.ai slash NYR to learn more about that. And since you're a member of this meetup, you get a 20% discount simply by using code NYHackR. That applies for people in the room, that applies for people virtually. All right? And 
After the talk, before the Q&A, we're gonna give away a couple tickets to NYR. We'll give away a ticket to someone in the room, and we'll give away a ticket to someone who is attending, who is attending virtually. So we're very happy to give you all those tickets, and anyone else doesn't get a ticket, NYHackR gives you a 20% discount code. We also have a conference we're putting on down in Tampa on August 23rd to 25th called D4Con. You can get more information at d4con.io. The theme there is different. It's not about R explicitly. It's about the sort of the fusion of like sports, entertainment, and security. So a nice blend of things. So learn more at d4con.io and use code NYHackR for a 20% discount August 23rd through 25th. And the last conference I'll talk about right now, we have our gov, that's back just like NYR, but for the government, that is at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., October 18th to 20th. It's not officially on sale yet. We haven't announced the speakers yet, but we will soon. And again, rstats.ai slash gov, same discount code, NYHackR. We also have the next two months planned for the meetup. They will be both in-person and virtual. We are very excited to have it both ways. June 6th for the next one, and we have Shobik Barari talking about the politics of U.S. elections. That should be a really cool talk. June 6th, we'll announce it next week. We also have July planned for the week before NYR, July 6th. We have a talk, we have the venue booked, we're just waiting to finalize details for the speaker. That will be announced probably June 7th, all right? Now, anyone out there in person or virtual who, is, who wants to give a talk, say hi. Find me in person, find me on Slack, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, find me anywhere, or find Nicole or anyone who works at Lander Analytics or is a member of the community and knows me, say hi and you can give a talk. If you don't, I will volunteer people and I already have some people in this room I'm already gonna volunteer. No one, you're overdue, just saying. It's been a year. All right, uh, I'll volunteer other people. So we need speakers to come give a talk. Likewise, we need hosts. We're very thankful to Two Sigma, we're thankful you've ever host, but we want to make sure we have a stable host because not every place can host us every month. So if you want to host us, let us know. If you have an office with space for a good amount of people, let us know. We'd love to uh, take up in your hospitality. So remember folks, check out all the conferences at nrstats.ai and d4con.io. Check out the NYHackR website at nyhackr.org and stick around to get free tickets and stick around if you're in person to go to the bar or if you're virtual, do your home bar. All right, with that, I am very excited to uh, announce our next speaker who does come from a city where you have to qualify the pizza. I want to make that very clear. They don't have pizza there, they have Chicago pizza. I want to, I want to stress that, I can't stress that enough. <laughs> and he's a longtime friend of the meetup, he's spoken at the meetup, and he's spoken at a conference, and you may know him from such packages as XTS and QuantMod. Not to be confused with Sybil or TidyQuant, right? These are packages that use base R and does really high performance stuff with a sound API you can always count on always being the same. It's been the same for 10 years, probably 20 years. 20? Yeah, it's a awesome. long time, and you can always get this consistency, which I actually really appreciate. Um, so please welcome the great Jeff. Or pizza that people say, no one says Chicago pizza, it's New York style pizza, which probably means something else. Um, thank you very much for uh, having me. I may have been one of the ones that he volunteered to come. <laughs> uh, I, my talk today is something I kind of harp on a lot um, amongst colleagues and just kind of being around data and I guess high performance computing for a long time, or seemingly a long time. My kids would say it's a long time. Um, and I think my take is I, I kind of have this like aversion to databases. Um, not because I don't like databases, actually, I find them totally fantastic and intriguing, but I also find them to be overkill in a lot of situations. So, my, my general first thing to do is to try and avoid them so I don't have to install them or maintain them or all the other pieces um, or ask somebody because I my very painful memories of uh, database administrators not being happy with me so anything I could do to avoid a database uh, is kind of somewhere in my head and some of the software as Jared had mentioned like XTS does a lot of what a database does without being a database so kind of the premise of the talk. I will see if I can manage not my laptop here. And I'll also apologize uh, somewhat in advance because I, these are 
kind of a compendium of multiple talks I've given. Um, and I've determined I try and rewrite talks. I literally do rewrite talks. This is probably like the 50th talk I've given publicly, and I intentionally rewrite them all of the time. So they're not the same. Um, it turns out some of the pieces, though, I, I don't think I can make any better in my head. So some of the stuff might not be the same format. Apologies in advance. So like I say, databasing without the database, uh, you can do a lot without actually uh, using a formal database. And I kind of just think all the, all the cool people do this. My, uh, my daughter is, uh, she said this to me one day, which really was disturbing, but also true, um, that yeah, the nothing dorkier than computer people who think they're cool. Uh, so and I, I agree, maybe. Um, but so, Jared pointed out, I have uh, been writing open source stuff since kind of the, I don't know, the dawn of popular open source maybe, uh, is mostly due to R. I started, I actually started using Python way before R, but R as a stats base at the time seemed like a better option for me. Yeah, it's not, not the year I was born, um, just in case you probably figured that out. I mostly have concentrated in the finance domain. So I wrote Quantma back in 06, and XTS was kind of an outgrowth of Quantma, which is time series, which I, I assume a lot of you know Wes, but Wes built Panda's time series based on XTS. Um, so kind of been around a long time, uh, which is so tiring to say. Also bro wrote the like interact interactive brokers interface for R and MMAP, which MMAP is closer to what I'm talking about today. Oh, I keep looking at the wrong screen. Um, I created um, this R and Finance Conference, which is happening next week in Chicago. We have held it for, this will be the 15th year, minus the year or so we didn't show up. But um, 15 years, about 300 people. I think it's a big, mo like it was some template for uh, Jared's conference. You drew a lot of inspiration. Yes, so um, we've been around for a long time. It's been a blast. Uh, I, anybody who likes finance, maybe everyone in this room, uh, should come one year. It's a, it's a great conference, and it's great for many reasons, but it's the, the people that show up are just fantastic. I don't know if that's our people, or I mean, we get everyone across the board, half of almost all of our keynotes have no idea what R even is, but they all write code in some language, and like, it's just this awesome community of people that care about stats and, and finance. Um, I currently work and have previously worked in the quantitative hedge fund space, um, and I live in Chicago, though I was born out here. Not New York, but Pennsylvania. And I, I really, my like, wheelhouse is, I just love making things faster than anyone else. So this is where Wes and I maybe, maybe disagreed, because uh, Wes tried to beat me. But uh, I don't think he did, though. But um, the first thing, um, well, yeah, the whole point of this talk, is that, I'm gonna look up there, is that uh, a lot of people, when they start to think about using data, they think about, like, I've gotta put it in a database. And um, so there's the gabillion choices, right? It's like Postgres, SQLite, Oracle, if you were crazy, um, Vertica, all the billion. There's like, five, I think there's something, there's a DB Engines website that ranks databases. And uh, I think they have like 410 or something on the list. Like, which kind of gives you some indication that none of them ever get it exactly right. right? There's just a lot of different options. And I use, I mean, I've used probably a lot of them. Um, I, I want to say, like, avoid the urge. Right? And because uh, that's, that's me. I always tell people they're, they're just files. Like, almost always, they're just files. Or it's memory. But all the stuff on top does some extra stuff. But it's not. It's definitely not helping performance. So if you have a domain problem, you can usually solve it without the above. Um, so uh, I guess the talk, the cadence of the talk, if you will, is, um, oh, actually, I'm gonna try and, I'm also not gonna try and hold up anybody in terms of uh, going to have a beer or pizza, so I'll, I'll try and be quicker than not. Um, so why do we use databases, really, is kind of the first point. Um, what is a database, in case anybody doesn't have like a reasonable grasp on what's really going on behind the, the curtain or in the black box. And then 
kind of the core of this is this, like, can we get database power without relying on a database? And in that context, this like no DB, which I think somebody else technically claims that they have used this term no DB, but I can prove that I used it before anybody else, um, like way too long ago. But it's, the idea is like, I kind of, I don't hate databases, but like there's just so much you can do without them. And uh, if you just know a couple of basic building blocks. In this case, I'm gonna talk about some examples, which would be MMAP, which is kind of the core of things, which is core of most databases, actually, um, not without argument. And then uh, I have an example, a small example, this is not my, not my specialty, but um, a small example of using MMAP and building something that applies to your domain. And then the last part is uh, this indexing package that I built, which is not on CRAN, but it's, in, it's on GitHub. It's been around for a long time. Um, and I built it for, again, a problem I had. So um, for those, uh, I guess the highest level I could think of of what a database is, it's basically just a bunch of records, generally some way to look stuff up. So whether they're like, it's gonna be fast to look it up or not, there's just a place where you put your data and then you go and fetch it. Which is why most people say, I need a database. Um, but you probably don't. Um, this is a very crude, although colorful, version of a database. Um, and the, the notion is like if you can kind of think about how a database looks to you or me in like physical space, or whatever, not physical, but virtual space, if you will, and then, um, and then how it actually is laid out. And there's kind of two, there's a bunch of different types of databases, but there's in like tabular world, there's a couple different versions. There's like row oriented and column oriented. Fortran and R use generally like kind of a column representation. And I don't, I think NumPy allows you to do both if I remember, I don't know what the default default is. But, um, but in general, you can see like if I had a bunch of rows and I want to store them because you got to turn them into something flat at some point, right? They got to be written out somewhere. They, they have to live either next to each other or somehow adjacent to each other, or I guess it's the same. But, um, and in a row database, they're literally just like across. So it, it means you can really get, like if you just need to pull out a row, it's very easy to go to that, you know, that, that chunk of memory that's there and go grab it and then send it back and do whatever you want for each one of the rows. Column ones work a little differently in that they're organized column major. So you get you know, all the A, B, Z, X, and B uh, together, and then the next, and oh, actually I screwed up the ordering down below. Um, either way, they're next to each other in column space. Indexes, which are really the thing that drives databases and the thing that makes them seemingly fast and magical is really just some, I mean, it could be different things, but here you could easily proxi, you know, approximate most of them with a simple sort of whatever column you're looking things up on. Not at the core, and I guess my point is like, there's no magic, there's no, it's sad, it's super sad to me, but there, there's no magic in anything. Um, so eventually you kind of look around enough and dig into details and you realize there's, there's just no magic. Um, I don't know if anybody's, how many people have had Malort? Anybody, anybody? Oh, I was gonna bring a bottle too, but I uh, could not find it at the airport and they usually sell at the airport. But uh, Malort is, anybody comes to Chicago, I'll buy you a Malort, 100%. Is that bread? <laughs> What's that? Is that bread? Is it, sorry. A threat. Is oh, a threat. <laughs> uh, it's could be, yeah. Um, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, I don't, it doesn't even have a description. It's Malort, look it up. Um, it's, a, it's a drink, but it is, it's not a pleasant drink, if you will. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, I don't know, it grows on you. I don't drink it very often, but I definitely drink it when people come to town. Um, so, uh, off, that, <laughs> off that topic. Oh yeah, I guess the, the other thing is that deep dish pizza, that's, that's a real pizza, yeah. <laughs> uh, databases, as I said, there's obviously a bunch of different types of databases. The, the thing I just drew was not a particularly fancy database, and it's kind of the one, but it's the one thing that like most versions of data are tabular. Almost everything you get is tabular, or it's just a bunch of stuff, right? like documents or something. But there's a whole bunch of different ways people organize databases, which also means that there's the 400 plus databases that exist in the world at any given time. Um, key values and documents and time series and geospatial. I am partial to the time series stuff. 
there's these, these vector like embeddings kind of databases now. There's graph databases, object stores like S3. There's just a bunch of ways to hold on to data. And again, it's like you got a record and you need to get to it and bring it back or put it there. But at its core, like it's kind of all they're doing. That's all I care about what they're doing. Like I don't really care what they're doing technically inside. Maybe I do, but like I don't really care. At the end of the day, I have a problem. I need to solve it. I need to solve it fast. I need to not run out of memory, all of those things, and, and maybe also for cheap. So like, those things matter to me. So record, some way to get to it. Um, the thing is, most of these databases, they're, they're really the same as the languages. Right? They, they all have some structure, some, uh, some memory outline, or uh, yeah, memory organization, or like a data structure that's holding onto your data, whether it's like a CSV-ish thing, or uh, like a, a bunch of different ways, like documents or whatnot. In R, and again, I, I, re I apologize that not everyone in the room maybe even likes R, but um, I'm going to keep talking about R. And I've used Python, and I like Go, actually, and I even like Python, but I don't like Python for statistics, but I do like Python in general. Um, except for the mutability. If somebody here could explain to me the mutability of Python and the, and the, the damage that does and make sense to me, that would be great. I will buy you a case of Malort. Um, <laughs> oh, so yeah, that was less of a threat. Um, but uh, So in R, we have things like lists or data frames, and obviously Pandas made data frames available in Python or environments. Um, they're, they're pretty much databases, right? They do everything a database does, uh, with the exception of things like if it's too big, they don't, they don't really fit unless you have a giant machine. Um, but even if you have a giant machine, usually there's other things on that machine, or you are running other things on that machine, even if there's not other things on the machine. Um, so like a database is good because they get rid of some of the problems like that, memory, and also fast search in standard, uh, structures, you, you won't necessarily have like a lookup design that would make it fast for you or efficient. So the two caveats or the two things I need out of a database, if you will, is allow them to live outside of memory because I don't always have as much memory as possible or I want. Um, I guess I never have as much memory as I want. And then make searches search fast, right? To, and that, not just to like, the, the benchmarks, everyone sees benchmarks, and benchmarks are fun, but benchmarks are generally useless in my experience. Like they're always, maybe not always, but a lot of them are contrived in some case, and they're never exactly your problem. And I don't know, I, they, it concerns me because then I go and have to iterate over which database does this part better and not this part better. And so I usually have like one problem I want to solve, and it'd be like, great if I could just solve that one problem in the way I needed to. So to run and also use. use Maybe everyone here likes SQL. I'm not a big fan of SQL. Um, I like to use like I like to use R, or I like to write code. And in those contexts, I don't want to have one extra layer of some something that lets me get data back into the language I need to use it in. So I, I kind of want to minimize that gap between me using the data and fetching the data. So again, on the outside of memory. Brilliantly, there's this mmap, which is a system call. Uh, it exists basically mmap or map view of file in Windows, but exists everywhere. Um, and it basically just lets the operating system take over for taking stuff from disk and bringing it into your process. Again, there's a lot of hand wavy here, physical and uh, whatever, illiteral. But um, the, the, the fast part is, like I said before, it's you just need an index of some sort, and there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but it's not super hard. You can make a you can make a kind of junky one, and it'll be better than you could imagine. Um, if for those, so who again? I like technical audiences because everyone's super smart. But uh, who uses or kind of have played around low-level MMAP calls? Anybody? So, couple, one, two, couple people, very few people. MMAP is a weird one because like. It literally drives almost everything in databases and on your, on your machines, but it's all behind the scenes. And, and it's also really hard to find documentation for because most of the people who know it are like low-level OS people or database people or file system people, not, not me, basically. Um, although now I know more. But uh, it, it's really neat. It's only like two functions. 
and you basically memory map a file or some set of memory. And uh, sorry, some set of a, like a disk, something that lives on disk. Maybe there's different ways to do this, but like a file. And you bring it in, and you don't actually bring it in at all. You just tell the OS that like I want the bytes at the beginning of the file and to some part of the file, or maybe offset somewhere in the file, and keep them ready for me to use. So it doesn't doesn't have to read the file directly. It doesn't do anything right away. And then you have this offset to go get the pieces, the bytes. But it's just the bytes, so it's not super duper helpful. Um, and then the one way to release them, let, let the OS take them back effectively, or that mapping back. And it's, it is virtual memory. So when you run out of real memory, it kind of goes to this paging thing, and the OS handles it all. But you can actually manage it yourself. The, uh, so like I say, it's used kind of everywhere. Um, it's binary, which is not super useful if you're used to using types or things in like a regular language. But it's there. It's also cross-platform, so you can kind of use it for in you know as interprocess communication between whatever you're running. I've got Go code, or I've got R code, or I've got Python code that's generating something that my R code needs. All that stuff I can kind of share using kind of the common underlying like doubles or whatever, yeah, whatever you want to phrase them as, like you know four-byte ints or something. So. This is also something, you could change the date on there all the time, because um, it's you always think you have a lot more memory than you used to, and it's true. But, like I said, that is true, but uh, if you look at machines, they have, while well, they have a lot more memory, they also have a lot more processing cores. And when you start to like average them out, you really don't have that much more memory per sort of unit of compute, which is really the limiting factor to me. Like, I can't make, I don't know, 100 jobs running at the same time if I only have uh, you know, the fraction of whatever, a quarter of a terabyte of RAM, I s you start to have just uh, not very much memory left per process. Um, so it's good to be able to share this memory. So again, if you skip that and do like a database, which sounds magical and is offloaded to somebody else, usually a DBA, um, and more hardware, then you can't really hit a database with a lot of connections. Some you can, but a lot of them don't like it. Your DBAs totally don't like it. Um, so those are problems. Network also doesn't like it uh, when you're moving things back and forth. Serialization, not super good either. Um, all these things are like real costs that belong to a database, which solves a different problem, but it doesn't solve like my analytics problem. I guess I should have phrased all of this around like analysis instead of storing like my bank account data. Sure, that should be in a database because it needs to be somewhere. But um, the like going and getting data to work on, I don't really want all that overhead. I just don't need that overhead. And it turns out you, you really don't need it. Um, and even better is now, instead of waiting for a spinning disk to go, you can, you know, SSDs are brilliantly fast. The M2 level stuff, Optane stuff, which has been sort of discontinued at this point, but blindingly fast. and and orders of magnitude cheaper than uh, RAM. So like all of a sudden you kind of have terabytes of pretty fast storage. Maybe not L2 cache or uh, RAM fast cache, but like pretty, pretty fast. Um, fast. Fast enough, more or less, depending on your problem. So again, whoa, that's weird. Um, this is, like you say, using disk. So you kind of have infinite amount of memory available, if you will. Um, this is, this is the MMAP package that I wrote, although this just happens to be the syntax. The syntax I wrote is actually very uh, low level, so it, it kind of looks more or less the same as you would if you use C or Python or something, except for the R version handles the, the uh, translation to the types in R. So again, there's multiple types. But you can see like here I generate whatever, three billion floating point numbers and then write them out to disk, so it's whatever, like 23 or 22 or whatever uh, gigabytes of data, or just a single vector of floats, random floats, nonetheless, and uh, you write them out, and then I can read them back in by MMAP, and it takes no time, because like, I'm not actually reading them in. They're just, they're now available to me, the whole, whatever it was, three billion doubles. You can sort of see in the syntax in the R version, you can see it says, you know, there's three billion of them, whatever, shows you a handful. 
you can get access to any of them. And all of those things, there's no timings around them, but they're basically instantaneous. They are instantaneous. Um, and you can see it doesn't take up any memory. Sorry, if you're not used to R, like the, the bottom V cells thing kind of from the top is the thing that's consuming your local memory. No memory is being harmed here, I guess is the right way to phrase that. Phrase that. Um, so I could say 20-ish something gigabytes of data. You use no memory in your system. Again, now if you're obviously going through it, you're using time and, and memory, but like you don't need to load it all at the same time. Uh, in MMAP is pretty neat, it's, well, at least uh, our MMAP package, because you can, it works on OS 10, it works on Windows, it works on Linux, it works on anything. Stable since 2010, it's been checked for, I don't know how many millions of times on CRAN, but uh, on the R archive page. I also built a whole bunch of things to like support basically any way you could represent data inside of memory is built into it. So, but the point is not to use it directly, it's to build upon it. And sorry, I guess, yeah, here, here's some of the types it can handle. So like anything you might have already, this is actually kind of the core, is that I, I really want to operate on binary data from somewhere else. So I don't, like it's sort of silly to generate data, write it out, and then read it back in. That's not very useful. But like if I have a process that's generating, I don't know, any of these, you know, like somehow four bytes uh, floating point, I, I need to be able to read that in. So this thing will support all the conversions kind of magically. R, unfortunately, does not have all of those directly, so it does some uh, internal work to, to make it work. But you can kind of read in anything, also write out anything if you need to with the note that you'll lose precision on certain things. Um, quick little example of uh, how this does work, or and I, yeah, how it works, not really internally, but kind of how it works. So you can see, you can just map things, read them back in, map them, read them back in. You can get the, kind of how big the thing is, you can get the individual numbers. There's very, very silly examples, um, but it's super simple. It doesn't require any skill. It just kind of says like, go get me this file, read it in, lazily and give me the piece of information I need on it. Um, in the one thing that's extra useful is that there are like a if you go back to or if I went back to my where is it? This thing? So like the row format, they're all stuck together like a C struct. So it's like there's an element inside of your piece of data that might be two bytes wide, and then four bytes wide, and then, I don't know, 20 bytes wide, and then four bytes wide. And they're all representing different things. It might be a string, it might be uh, integer, it might be whatever. In that same way, data, again, that you're reading from some other process, you can tell it what that, what that process or what that data looks like, and say, oh, there's a four byte or whatever, 16, you know, short integer, there's a normal four byte integer, there's a, a regular floating point in there, it kind of puts them together, and then you can read and write them. So everything like in that struct, like row-based orientation, is there. That sort of structure is then, as an example, which I wish I knew where I was here, but um, as an example is there's this uh, R Cosmo package in R, which is, I think, currently experiencing a uh, not on CRAN moment because of some upstream dependency, which is not a map, broke it. But um, it is used for the, for, I, I know nothing about this field, by the way, but like microwave radiation that they, or whatever, uh, waves that they capture to whatever plot stuff. I really don't know anything about this field. Um, but you can see like the previous example or the previous way you could do this in R, you would have to load the entire data set and it took, whatever is that, uh, a long time, right? 900 seconds. And now it takes basically no time. It's like 400 times faster. So they can now iterate through all of what they're doing on the research side without having to either run out of memory or run out of time to compute it, and it lets them very simply kind of iterate over what they're working on. To do that now for anything, I kind of made it like, what if you could just do it for a basic data frame? Like get rid of the data frame in memory, put it into uh, this memmap file, and load it 
Again, tried to make it super simple. Same kind of thing, you say as mmap, it magically, it's not really much magic actually, but it takes your, this MT cars data set, which is what you see there, and transforms it into out of memory. So like, or sorry, not in memory, um, using this C-struct thing. So you can see at the bottom, like A, it renders the same in R, plus or minus, um, so you can see everything. And then there's also, uh, you can see it's, you know, even, it, it's a silly small data set, so it doesn't really make much difference. But you can see it doesn't take up any memory once you're using the memory mapped version of it. But it also means you can share it amongst processes. So if you pretended it wasn't a dumb data set and it was something large, you don't need to consume memory across all the processes. They can actually all share them on the same machine. Um, this is another sort of example, a little bit, um, oh, sorry, this is actually taking a map and extending it to like more of a problem space or another domain. Um, this is another, uh, this is like another uh, entity I am involved in and uh, we kind of monitor all the regulatory holdings that the SEC records. And so in the particular case of like 13F filings, which are just institutional holdings, just like you guys obviously file them as well, but um, there's some things, probably even more than this now, maybe 60 or 70 million holdings are, are recorded there. And it's, they're all separate. They're all like across 200,000 files and such. It's kind of a mess. Um, it's not a total mess, but it's not super easy to deal with. But you can also take it kind of work it in and hide a lot of the like how you make it this way, but you can take it and put it into this indexing package that I wrote to make it look like a database. I mean, it looks just like a database, except for if you use R, it looks a lot more like R than writing SQL. So I can say, give me IBM for this reporting period across whomever, and then give me back on that right side, that transform sort of select thing. Um, exactly like regular R code, I just want to, you know, whatever, uh, multiply by a thousand because everything's filed that way. And then per share, you know, implied price kind of thing. And I don't know where the filer CIK comes from, but basically you can run like a, a SQL query, but without being SQL against a very, you know, not giant large, but like 70 million, 60 million, or whatever this one is, 57 million, um, 14 gig data set without using, again, my no RAM harmed, you're using no memory, right? So it's, it's just there. You're not actually consuming any memory. So any computation you need to do on your side doesn't need to sort of sift or uh, exchange out the data you needed to bring in to go and grab the particular component you needed. Um, and it's also super fast, right? Whatever, 70 milliseconds. Um, not, not really slow, probably on par with most databases that would have that level. And this might be from a few years back, frankly. Um, but uh, it's pretty fast, and it doesn't require any code, really. It's like I showed before, it's a, a couple of those little functions that you wrap, and then everything magically happens in the background, and it's all in your own process. So there's no database, you're not running anything, you don't have a Postgres running somewhere, or piping things to Postgres, or making sure it's standing, or all those things. Like, it's just static data that anybody can run anywhere. Um, this is, sorry, if you know there's a sort of a structural break in the, in the style of these slides. Um, I couldn't quite make this description as good as my previous one, so I, I kind of stitched together two of these things. Um, and this is what, like, this combination of MMAP and indexing. And the whole point is, like, indexing I like, and it's super useful, but it's the fact that you can build upon really basic pieces like MMAP and sorting a vector, and you can turn kind of anything, if it's an R or wherever, very easily into something that's high performance that is like enables you to do either more research or uh, get something faster into production or, or whatever, but like just really, really simple building blocks. So here, this indexing thing is, uh, like I say, pretty fast search. I feel like I lost something on this page. Um, and what indexing does is really, it's like a column store, like a Vertica or Fortran or R at their core. Um, and it adds binary search, also some like bitmap indexing kind of magically, and then and this mmap, so you don't need to keep it in memory. 
Same thing. It's, uh, we're basically taking a data frame, which you could do in Python or R or whatever, and write out each one of those columns into a file. Again, Arrow kind of does a lot of this too, but, um, but again, with an additional step. Uh, this then allows you to have unlimited data, and more importantly to me, is you get to keep the R interface. Like there's no difference in how I consume the data from my like R perspective, R code perspective. And really there's just three pieces to this whole package. It's you create an index, you load the index you already created, and then there's like the subset operator. Um, you can see it kind of does a bunch of different things, maybe different things, um, to make it faster. Kind of looks like a database, but it's all in memory. It's all in your own process. There's nothing else running. Um, but it's just as fast as a database. In fact, benchmark this way back before Amazon bought Parkcell, which is now Redshift. And the only public benchmark this beat Parkcell on, um, and that was like a long time ago with really not great code on my side. Um, there's not a lot of, it's kind of the way like KDB works too. There's not, the beauty is in its simplicity and how you can get a lot of performance out of very simple things. Um, and in this case, like I say, this, this is probably the best way I can describe it, is that this, what indexing does, it lets you kind of build this environment or a data frame effectively of a bunch of columns, and then you can tell it which column you want to look, search on. Same thing, there are, this is like internally, but not really relevant other than you can see it does extra stuff, but not super important to user space. You can see super easy to create things. Syntax on the right is a little bit more novel or useful. I can say like give me everything less than zero or everything greater than one and less than minus, yeah, I guess that's a one, um, minus three, or even transform the output. And all in pure R, no extra weird, I say weird, but no extra SQL or anything else. Um, and as Possible. I'm probably somewhere near the end of my slides. Um, this was, again, a pretty old data set now, but something like a bunch of U.S. equity options contracts, like daily contracts, and not huge by any stretch, but way bigger than my laptop, which plugs in the back of the room at the time. Um, it, just, it doesn't fit, doesn't work. You could not do anything with it. So here, though, by mapping them all in, you can now get from 70 million-ish rows, I can grab everything that belongs to Apple. Or I can, and you can see like, you know, 91,000 things show up um, in, you know, milliseconds. So again, not, not really big, but my little MacBook was uh, not up to the task of it keeping it in memory, especially if anything else is running. This is sort of a little more of a demonstration, if you will. Um, a whole bunch of kind of queries you would maybe run to explore an options data set um, or kind of generate some new data set from it. And you know, they're pretty reasonably complicated queries. They're not, they're not anything tremendous, but they're, I don't know, they'd be, they'd be painful to write in, in all honesty. And SQL for me, um, but I can kind of do anything, right? I could say like all the standard stuff you'd kind of expect to, to think about and be able to quickly see. And you can run them all in, and you know, it's like this seven query, seven graphs, which are not super fast to, to draw, uh, in five seconds on, again, on a MacBook Air that has no memory and is running uh, you know, against a, a pretty large data set compared to what it, what it has resource-wise. And those are all the things that get generated, again, useless to any of us in the room, but nonetheless, like visually, kind of instantaneously, you can get this view of your data that does not fit in your computer. Whatever, you, again, you could have a, you could have a thousand nodes and still run into the limit that you've also got 200 people using the nodes and you've got to be scheduled and you've just got to make the best use of your resources. And this thing can pull off most of what you want to do without kind of any resources, except for a little bit of code. Um, so that's kind of my take. I feel like this might be the end of my slides. Um, yeah. And uh, so you can do a lot without relying on other people's code, I guess is number one. 
Um, it doesn't really require much. You, I mean, I have code to do this, but it's really just the system call that every machine has. And you could look at my code and figure out trivially how you would access the system call and build whatever you need. And I'm sure, I would guess Python and Julia have something similar. I don't think it's quite as well, um, I don't think it's quite as easy to use, but it would be trivial to do. Um, and you can get so much, like you can still need, you still need a database. I don't want to discount the database, but like for regular analytical processing of lots of data, you can do a lot more with less resources, which I am always resource constrained, uh, and for basically free, and it'll never break to like, no, the database isn't down, somebody's not yelling at you at three in the morning. Um, you can kind of get by with a lot less and get the same output or better uh, just by knowing a few of the little tools underneath and how they work. So if anybody has, uh, you can go to the GitHub, the, the actual, those packages are there, all the source code's there. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, that LinkedIn is whatever. I don't really like LinkedIn, but it's there if you want that. Um, and then, and the last in my email, uh, my email's everywhere and they're all different emails, but that, that one actually belongs to a, uh, a time series database, which I know, uh, that I'm actually building, um, which we talked about maybe last time. But uh, yeah, so anyway, that's it. I, I mean, I'm happy to take any questions or asks or criticisms or tell you where the pizza is again or whatever. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks. And Jeff, please repeat the question to the people on camera because they can't, they don't, might not hear this necessarily. Oh. Um, so I'll oh. the first question. Are you embracing the pipe now? Is that what that means? Uh, it was mostly to uh, mock the tidyverse pipe. Yeah, I, right. hate, I hate, no, I like pipes, but not, I don't use pipes very often in R, uh, but when I do, I would use that one. <laughs> but then on the right-hand side, you need to have a function called back up close parentheses. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Like I said, I don't use them. I use them in, in uh, shell scripting, because that's really good, but uh, yeah. No, not Great, so me, Sean, and Jeff, I hope that more of the crowd have questions. No one has questions. I remember, please repeat the question after you ask yep. Does indexing require that you have a data frame like set of uh, columnar MF tables, or can you use indexing if you've done like some weird like row based, you know, more complex MF? So uh, it's a good question. Um, sorry, yes. Can, can, yes. Okay, I'll try and repeat it. Hold on. Give me a challenge. Um, does indexing the package require a data frame structure to do its indexing on? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that is true. The, the thing that indexing does, they're not, it looks like they're row based because that's sort of the way they're represented in a, in a data frame. But the way R represents them is columnar. So what actually happens behind the scenes is they, each one of the columns is written out separately to its own file and then can be lazily loaded, if you will, via MMAP um, based on what subset you're looking for. But also, to that point, they're indexed by column. So even if, like, they're, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're row-oriented, if you will, when they come back but they are actually being pulled from like a column or database. Yeah, two mics, we'll see if they both work. Right. Hold them just near each other. Okay, uh, so the simpler question then is can I run indexing on mmapped vectors that I have on disk that I'm not creating out of R, but you know if I have like a bunch of long bi binary yep vectors that I'm mapping from some other data source, will, can indexing work with those, or does it have to be created out of the indexing data frames? Uh, so the question is, does it need to originate in R? Yeah. More or less. Um, it doesn't really, I mean, it probably does only by construction, not by any real requirement. Like the indexing part would just need to know where the data 
lives. Basically, what happens is at the beginning, everything is just written out binary by column. So like whatever it is, you've got a floating point, you've got a string, you've got a whatever, or set of strings, and they're all written out in columnar fashion. So in, and I say columnar, they're all written out one by one as a file. Binary file with some predetermined length, the number of things in it, and so forth. They also do all have to have the same number of items because they, they need to line up. Um, but apart from that, the, the indexing part will use that to then generate the index, if you will. So it doesn't, it doesn't need it ahead of time, but it right. needs to at least know what it is. Right. So if I have four billion lengths and map binary things, yep. indexing will do the, build the index and the run yeah, the code and all yeah. of that. Although I don't know how fast it will be, but yes, gotcha. yeah. <laughs> it's not super optimized at this moment, although it does work on large scale stuff. Um, but no, it would not have any, you wouldn't even need any extra coercion, if you will. It would just kind of go at it as data is over here, turn it into an index. And, and the indexing that it does is uh, everything from, and again, it's, it's mostly a, an effort to showcase like what you can do with the underlying tools and how kind of easy it is to build the, the indexing package by way of like the, the MMAP package is, I don't know, 20, I don't even know actually, but maybe 20,000 lines of C code. It's all like super highly optimized C code and for all the different data types and everything. The indexing package that sits on top of it or uses it is maybe a couple thousand lines, tops of R code. It's, it's super trivial. It's like basically just takes the pieces underneath and then puts them together in this data frame format. But just like the R Cosmo package, they do the same thing with MMAP underneath. And I don't know if they built an index on top of it, but they basically have, I actually had to uh, change the, they, they have weird, like the FITS data structure, which is like some uh, astronomy centric, structure for uh, managing all of that stuff. It is, uh, th they use big Endian somewhere in the struct. Like there's something kind of wonky about it because it dates from, I don't know, it's like 30 years old or 40 years old. And um, so they still use big Endian. So I, I kind of modified this the MMAP stuff to be able to handle big Endian within a struct. So like if you could think of, you know, it's got a regular int and then for some reason there's a field that's big Endian, it can handle all of that kind of back and forth. So, but they just took the regular MMAP code. There's another, there's like a, a gene sequencing package that does the same thing. Well, not the same thing, but like similar-ish stuff where it takes like this underlying binary that I have no idea, MMAP doesn't have any idea about, and is able to like kind of stitch it together in the way that makes sense, like whether taking the headers into a separate section and like understanding the breakdown. Um, to index that, I don't, it wouldn't like directly work it could easily work, like you just have to like hack it effectively, because it's not doing anything. It's just taking a vector, turning it into something like an RLE, like a run length encoding, or some bitmap vector, or whatever would make sense. Um, and, or, and it also makes sense sometimes to just not have an index, like depending on what you're looking at, it, it might, especially like run length encoding kind of stuff. Depending on cardinality and such, you, you might just be better off scanning the whole thing or like where you're at. So it, it lets you do a lot of those things, but by default indexing is kind of dumb out of the box. If you've ever used like data table in R, it's basically like an out or KDB. It's basically like what those two things can do, but where they're kind of prescribed, like a data table in R is it's just rectangular. There's no, there's no multi-dimensional anything. It's rectangular. Um, so it does the same kind of thing, except for a data table in R has to be in memory. And when you run out of memory, you're kind of screwed. So like this allows you to jump past that and also not have to use up any of your memory for a data set that you might only be using a part of. Thanks. Thanks. Before we ask another question, um, I was reminded I'm supposed to do the, the giveaways first, then we'll do the rest of the questions. So we'll be right back with you of all of your questions. Uh, so pause for one second and I'll do what I should have done five minutes ago. All right, uh, we're gonna give away two tickets um, and we also have a virtual co uh, question also. Um, all right, so two tickets, one for virtual NYR, one for in-person NYR. The virtual winner and you will be contacted is Helen Passio. Helen, virtual land somewhere? We'll be contacting you for your free ticket. And then in person, do you have to be physically present to claim it? Is that the rule? All right, if you're not here, we're moving on.
Uh, um, Aaron Amakwa. Aaron? All right. You win a ticket. <laughs> We'll find you afterwards and get your information. Cool. All right, then I'll ask the virtual question since I'm up here. Um, how do we get existing data, like in a CSV, memory mapped? Uh, that, that one I actually did re So I, I, this package dates from the indexing package. The MMAP package I've updated all the time. So I, like many of you in the room, I work in a reasonably guarded space, and uh, they didn't let me touch anything for the most part. Um, but I did maintain this package, this MMAP thing, because it has nothing to do with finance. For uh, all the time, I was not allowed to do anything else. And so that, that one's continuously updated. It doesn't need a lot of updating. The indexing one, though, uh, I has always worked, but I've not updated very much, except for in the last like six months. I started to make it uh, more kind of feature filled and more documentation and re kind of readying it to publish. Um, and in that context, there is now a MMAP CSV function that allows you to sort of like blanket create, actually as MMAP will create the CSV, but then you can also read in a CSV directly with that. It does a little bit of gymnastics to kind of read each column first and then write them out, but it does like if you had 100 columns, it's only going to read one at a time, so you, you still preserve your local memory and write them out. You know, again, it's, it's not, the indexing package also is like multi-threaded and it does a bunch of kind of fancier stuff. It also even um, does, I didn't point this out, but it does um, like horizontal and vertical, well, kind of by default it does vertical partitioning, but like does horizontal partitioning. So you can run it across different, um, different either files or file systems or, yeah, it, it does a lot of that stuff. It tries, tries really hard to be a database without being a database. Um, but yeah, there's now a function that just says like create CSV or read CSV. So it's, I think it's an MMAP CSV, so it doesn't collide with read CSV. And it does multiple CSVs, like I said, except you point it to a bunch of files and sort of create them from those data. Uh, yeah, although they'd all have to be the same length to glue them together, because then they wouldn't make sense. Columns or number of rows? Uh, number of rows. Columns, it doesn't care about. It doesn't even care about the order of the columns. Kind of like a database, like, I mean, they might be, you know, they're somewhere, it doesn't really matter. It shouldn't matter to you. It'll preserve the order you loaded them in, but that's just for your own benefit of like seeing them in the same order instead of them all shifting around. But they're, it doesn't, it doesn't care inside. Yeah, I have a question about indexing. Um, so you said that you could across two or more tables so that they have a either on a primary key, secondary key? Mm, not particularly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> can you, can you uh, like have primary, secondary keys across multiple tables effectively? Like can you, can you join tables? Just have a common, have a common index. Yeah, uh, not, yeah, not by default, certainly, but I, uh, it'd be fun to add. I, like, like you say, I've tried, it's, it was kind of this proof of concept that turned out to be really useful, and I'm trying to make it into something that's more useful to other people. So yeah, any, I mean, any, if you send me an email or, or I mean, I'll remember that, but like things like that would be neat to add in. Um, just use cases that I didn't need, but are also useful to other people. That's the whole reason, I mean, I like open source so much, and I dislike that open source is kind of in, trouble because so many people have uh, contributed and then kind of lost interest in contributing because no one got anything out of it or very you know, little out of it and they kind of were you know, in a handful of cases vilified for contributing things. Um, I, I would like to see open source not die. Uh, I think the world needs to not have it die. Um, so yeah, any suggestions, anything, usage, whatever, I'm super excited to do, always. Um, Thank you. Hey, I have a question on um, just multiple set setting for these tables. So, um, I guess the question would be, when you subset the MMAP, um, does it load in each individual column at the time when you subset, or how does that work? No, it actually goes, so there, there may have been a slide on there that when you, it doesn't like, um, what do you call it? it doesn't materialize anything. Um, what it will do is just find the pieces it needs and then when you're ready to materialize it by in the R syntax, it's just like you need a trailing comma. Like if you just, if you gave the command without a comma, it will just tell you how many things, like actually one of the examples that how many times Apple existed. 
that that's basically instantaneous because it doesn't have to go lift the data. So yeah, if, does that is that what you were asking? Yeah, I was guessing also just like if I was doing like a subset, for example, and I wanted to then pipe that into another subset downstream, like would that be a possibility or how would that work? Uh, that does actually work, although it needs to be like in. I don't remember the syntax of that, but yes, it does. It tries hard, and again, this is where like real databases can do a better job because they have better like, um, like what's the right word uh, planning like uh, query plans. Um, so this this tries, and it also tries to do things like uh, com it, it handles compression as well, and and does some other kind of fancy things. A lot of them at the margin don't really add much value, which is weird. Um, but yeah, it also does things like if you're, if, you're, if you're looking for like a large sequence, it won't memory map that chunk. It'll actually read it sequentially because it's generally a lot faster than a memory map. Memory maps are very good for random access, not super good for, well, it's just fine, I guess, same as random access, but it's like sequential pulling is much, much faster. So it tries to condition itself in a sort of simplistic query plan to say, don't do this yet now do this and make sure you get it this way instead of this way, so. Thank yep, thank you. Okay, then um, we have another question from Virtual Land. How does this compare to uh, FS or Arrow or Big Memory or just Frame? So, repeat the question. Yeah, well, okay. don't, you're not might. Oh my gosh, okay. How does this compare to, what was the first one? Uh, FS. Big memory, arrow, or disk frame. Okay, uh, I don't. I don't think I know what FS or disk frame is. Um, although I think I've seen disk frame at some. Yeah, I talked about it a few years ago. Yeah, is that still uh, I don't functioning? Think arrow. I think the person who ran it sort of hasn't developed it as much. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, not. I mean, no. No shade on that because I have a lot of things that are not touched. But um, yeah. Uh, big. So the thing that I think M map. So. Indexing is closer to like big memory or let's just say big memory um, because they both are kind of tabular in, in nature. MMAP itself is more the thing that drives or would drive big memory if it wasn't hard coded to be tabular. So like MMAP lets you do things like the Cosmo data or gene data or whatever any arbitrary structure that is binary in nature, like time zone files, for instance. Time zone, like compiled time zone files have all this crazy weird offsets. And like those are, generally speaking, read very slowly by the operating system even, and certainly by R. So you can do things that are much faster by understanding the, the binary format. And you could do it the same with like whatever audio files or, or anything that's that's not strictly you know, one type of thing, and it's got some structure to it, MMAP would let you build your own like memory mapping effectively for some structure. There's nothing else that does that. Like FF is another one that maybe that, I don't know if that's FS or FF, but FF is the other package that does this, and there's like a billion of these FF ones. It's, MMAP is faster. Um, I don't know if they all work on Windows. This works on all operating systems, has for the last 12 years, 14 years. Um, like I say, the two things are like, MMAP is really the, it's a very lightly uh, exposed version of the system call. So anything you can pass to the system call, you can pass, and whether it works depends on the operating system you're on. Like sometimes those system calls don't actually exist on the operating system, like reserving space and all the stuff or shared objects. Like sometimes those don't work on Windows or, or other operating systems. Um, but MMAP tries not to get in the way, it just makes it easy to consume the output. Because otherwise it's just raw bytes. And like, unless you know it's an integer, even MMAP doesn't know what's an integer. It doesn't have header information, so you need to know what's underneath it. But once it does, it gives you back that. Whereas in Python or Perl or anything else, uh, unless you have like a special package to do it, you're just going to get back raw bytes, which is then you have to do all the work to convert them back to whatever you wanted and do them either. This all does. This all happens in C, so it's like as fast as possible, and it's all been the coolest part of R is the packaging system as. Jared can attest, or also the most painful part, um, is that the, the rigor that that thing has to go through across things from like old versions of Solaris for the longest time on Spark. It still had to compile and run on Spark. It was like, this is ridiculous. I don't have a Spark machine. I did, but I don't anymore. It's like, and it's 
crazy, it still has to. But it's super neat because it still runs on all of them. It's like, okay, well, you kind of know, you've pushed the bound on all of this stuff and it just kind of works, but I, it's harder to do when you're higher level. So this thing, I tried to make it you know, as perfect as possible at the low level, so then you can build upon it without worrying about you know, that going wrong effectively. I don't know if that answered the question, but sort of. Meandering Yeah, <laughs> it's it's different than some. Uh, Mike is actually the big memory person. Has um, kind of just even last conference, he he pointed out. He's like, I think your the MMAP approach. He wants to help on MMAP because he's like, I think that's the right way to do it because then you don't have this like, oh, it doesn't fit in a table or it, you give up the other things though. Like it's hard to do matrix multiplication here, whereas like they've kind of solve that, but you could also solve it by like building upon the low layer. So we, that's where we talked about like collaborating on things, just because like it's, their way is very restrictive, like if you fall into the pattern, similar to the databases, like right, if you have a database, like Redis is great for what Redis does, but it's not super good for other things, and Postgres is not good for Redis type stuff, or like, or Mongo type stuff, right, even there's much maligned Mongo, it's like I still use Mongo, because I don't know, it's dumb and it works, and it just works, like I don't know what to say, but it's like, it works. And uh, so, yeah, that's the point was like make a package that, or make this tool, make it easier to use the underlying system calls that everything relies upon, really everything, and uh, and make it robust. That's kind of the takeaway. And indexing was just like a good example that made it easier to use for me from tabular data. And the mic he was referring to is uh, Michael Kane. He spoke at the meetup a few months ago. Uh, so you search nyhackr.org and you can search for Michael Kane. He's given a bunch of talks most recently a few months ago. And big memory is a out of memory matrix, not a data frame, but a matrix. Yeah, yeah, correct. Oh, that's the other side too. Yeah, it's a matrix, right? That's a pretty big difference, which is where like I wrote XTS and XTS is all, is just a matrix. And people have complained for 17 years that it's just a matrix because you can't, you can't store a column of whatever tickers, but it's also you can't multiply a column of tickers, so it was always based on a matrix, like it was the order of operations in R was, it's a matrix, I can do matrix math on it, and if it's got some characters in it, I can't, I would never do that, so they shouldn't even be there, which is kind of maybe a ridiculous assumption. Yeah, but it was like, that's what, it, it was meant to be a replacement in, with time for matrices, which is like, so, I tried, to, I tried to constrain all of them to like their domain effectively. Any other in-person question? All right, just let me check. All right, if you have anyone in person, one last second, let me check what's up first in mind. There was a question about loading data from CSVs, but we sort of answered that, right? Um, there's a question about how does you have to write the original binary file, but it sounds like you don't need a binary file. CSVs will do it, yeah. Yeah, or it'll make it, like if you do as MMAP, it'll create all the files. But you actually, the, at the core, is just read bin or write bin. I mean, not, sorry, the read bin is less of that, but like to write them out, you can't, you can't create a file with MMAP. You actually, like the system call, you need to have like a prescribed range or a size of the file to work with. Even if it's, it can technically be like a, whatever, a empty file or whatever, zero byte file, but um, they, although that's super, implementation specific. Uh, but for the most part, if you write out a big binary file that has, you know, it's got a million four byte integers, it's four million bytes long, all zeros, and then you can map anything into it. Or, but uh, I mean, MMAP does this for you. If you just say as MMAP for a vector of is three billion. Like, yeah, CSV, is it right to disk? Yep. Yeah, you can specify where. Yeah, it basically it reads the CSV. So if it starts from a CSV, it'll read the CSV in uh, one column at a time effectively. Um, Trying to remember how that actually works. But yes, it'll read each part in and then write them out so it can use the whole thing later without consuming all of the memory up front. If I try to do like say RDS on this object, it won't work. It's, it's an environment that has got, yeah, it's basically just pointers to OS owned memory. So yeah, you're not gonna save it. Okay. Um, this is a question for me. Can I integrate square brackets in text to use like select and focus and stuff like that? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, it's super, like if you look at the indexing code, it's not, it's pretty, there's some kind of crazy stuff in there, but for the most part, it's super simple, yeah. It's basically just going to, the, just getting stuff from MMAP. I mean, maybe inside of your crazy, whatever, tidy version of those brackets, um, inside they really call brackets, so yeah. You can wrap it with whatever you want. Wonderful, <laughs> brackets are just fun. <laughs> That's correct, yeah.
then lastly, the code you put up, the seven, you didn't put up the code, the seven problems, the seven plots, is the code up on GitHub somewhere? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think so, but I can dig up and put on. All right, well, I think we will address it. Yep. yep. Last chance for any questions before I just do a closing announcement? Okay, then big round of applause to Jeff. The slides and the video will be up at nyhackr.org in a few days. A uh, big thank you to Two Sigma for hosting us here. Uh, yeah, big round of applause for them, thank you. Some of you work here, but. <laughs> Uh, remember, we have next month's meetup, June 6th. The meetup after that, July 6th. We have the New York R Conference, July 11th through 14th. We have D4Con coming up in August, and RGov in October, and we'll have many meetups and other fun events um, going on. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next month. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. See you soon.